the next part of the deformation mechanisms and damage in material is irradiation damage, which is a very specific type of damage. And well, the same scheme, I would like you to focus on basic phenomena, on the damage mechanisms and on the way how materials respond to the irradiation damage. The same scheme again, I will show you some observations. We try to increase the knowledge and try to draw more or less important conclusions which then have impact on the design. In short, what we are considering are irradiation basics at the beginning, then defects, effects, mechanisms. Let's right start with the basics on irradiations. Here the most important questions probably are what is irradiation? How do we quantify irradiation or irradiation damage? And what are the basic mechanisms which lead to the damage? Typical examples for nuclear reactions and decay, as you probably all know, are alpha decay, that's the emission of a helium nucleus, or beta decay, that's the emission of electrons or positrons, gamma decay, that's a gamma radiation or X-ray radiation, nothing else than extremely short wave light. And in general, neutron radiation and the uh, occurrence of neutron irradiation is always combined with a nucleus decay. The typical particle energies are measured in electron volt, of course. And in gamma radiation from a decay of nuclei are in the range of three. MeV, mega electron volt infusion technology, it's the famous or typical 14 MeV. And uh, during a tomography session, you might have already experienced, or hopefully not, you will um, experience 450 keV. Neutrons in fission reactors are in the range of 5 MeV. Again, in fusion reactors, 14 MeV and spallation sources, that's very specific uh, sources for neutron production, they have very high energies, 600 MeV. The charged particles, that's alpha particles or uh, helium nuclei, are only 1 to 5 MeV. Ion, single ions from atoms by displacement damage, we will see this later on, is in the range of 500 keV and the beta decay, which produces electrons, is in the range of 1 MeV. Maybe more interesting is the measurement of uh, decay. The activity is given in Becquerel and indicates how many nuclei of a <coughs> material decay per second. So nothing else. And as, as a dk per second, dk per time, that's a Becquerel. Um, since this is not so informative, since it only numbers the uh, dk rate, there is also the measurement of a dose. This is given in gray and it indicates the energy absorption of a radiation type in matter. So one gray equals one joule per kilogram. Um, this is only no, uh, also not the end of the story because um, this dose just measures the energy per volume or per, per kilogram per mass but doesn't say anything about the damage it, it does. For example, if you experience one gray irradiation of, uh, let's say, electrons, you probably won't care, but if you suffer from one gray of exposure of neutrons, your health might be already damaged. So um, 
the type of radiation has to be weighted by weight factors. You see it here. X-ray and gamma ray has uh, no weight or weight factor one, as well as electron radiation or positron radiation. Neutrons have a very high or much higher impact on the organic damage. So therefore the weight is between 5 and 20 and also helium or helium nuclei <coughs> alpha radiation has a weight factor of 20. This leads finally to the organic dose and here that's the energetic dose weighted by the factor. Uh, very small, you probably can't read it, me too, um, is the penetration depth of these different types of radiation. I have uh, plotted it here for steel. If we have um, one MeV energy radiation by X-ray or gamma, the penet penetration depth is about 10 centimeters. For electron radiation it's only one millimeter, so it doesn't affect the internal structure at all. For neutrons it's one meter, so that's a lot more. And for alpha irradiation it's only five micrometers. So alpha irradiation is in principle harmless if it comes from the outside, it doesn't even penetrate a sheet of paper. But if we incorporate materials which emit alpha radiation, then you have a problem because internally five microns are a lot depending on where the irradiation takes place. The dose power uh, finally, uh, that's the dose divided by unit time or time and it's given in sievert or micro millisievert. Now let's first focus on iron irradiation because that's more simple. If you consider a fast iron emitting, emitted from a source and hitting a metallic lattice, wh what happens? If you are used to play pool billiard or so you already know all the answers because the same is happening in any lattice. You have a projectile or a ball with a kinetic energy E and it hits somewhere a lattice atom and is scattered with a facing a loss of its energy. The loss of energy has been transferred elastically to the lattice atom which is also displaced from its lattice place and this has the energy T. There is a minimum energy which is required to displace such a lattice atom from its um, lattice place and of course this depends on the material on the specific lattice. With this we can subdivide damage in two sections. One is the primary damage. This means each, each projectile, this can be neutron, electron or ion, for the moment we stay for ions, is usually scattered not only one time, it's scattered several times through the lattice. It transfers energies to a multitude of several lattice atoms. Uh, during each scattering event it creates so-called primary knock-on atoms. These are the atoms which are kicked out of their lattice sites. And so lattice atoms are kicked off in different directions and with different energies T. This pKa, primary knock-on atoms, are then available in a multitude of very different directions and energies, that's the pKa energy spectrum. The secondary damage then is produced by the pKa's themselves. They in turn release their energy also by inelastic collisions, these are electron-electron uh, interactions uh, which can lead to electromagnetic radiation or by again elastic nuclear reactions which generates defects in the lattice. And the most common or obvious defects are the generation of Frankel pairs. Frankel pairs are a vacancy where once the atom uh, 
was on its lattice side and this is kicked off into an interstitial place. So a vacancy and an interstitial, that's what we call Frankel pairs. But there are also more severe damages which are called displacement cascades and they are produced to the series of defects which the collisions um, produce. This is what it looks like if we have a primary knocked-on atom. It leaves a series of secondary damage behind it. So it produces a rather high point effect density. It produces chemical disorder because all the atoms are moved and also a topological order. The lattice is in many places destroyed or dissolved. To count for all these damages or displacements, which we call displacement damage, you need a separate measure. And this radiation displacement damage is usually measured in units of DPA, simply displacements per atom. And one DPA means that during the irradiation, in the average, each atom was displaced once. So if you have a piece of material, put it somewhere to irradiate and stop it after it has reached the dose of one DPA, it means that your piece of material is completely new. It has nothing to do with your original material since on the atomic level each atom is on another position as it was initially. Of course, in uh, that's a theoretical point of view. In practice you still have the same material, but okay, you know after one DPA each atom in this material has changed its place. Okay, let's follow on from there. A scattering process, that means uh, ion, ions at targeted atoms usually are described by the cross-section. A cross-section, that's sigma here, not stress, that's the scattering cross-section, gives the number of reactions per scattering center per second, that's the collisions, divided by the fluence of the incidenting projectiles. So the resulting unit is one per second divided by one per second and uh, one per square centimeter. In the end, it's centimeter square or barn, that's the physical unit. And one barn equals 10 to the minus 28 square centimeters. That's rather theoretical at the moment, but uh, I hope to explain it better in the following sections. To determine the displacement cross-section, this is necessary to treat primary and secondary damage separately. So let's first focus on the primary damage. Remember, this was the incidenting projectile, the particle, or in our case, an ion. And here, the produced PKA atom <coughs> energy T is given by this formula. I hope you can read it because I had a problem with the uh, coloring on this uh, strange software from Microsoft, but well, I don't say it uh, too loud here on video, nevertheless. It's a simple geometric equation and the primary damage is closely linked to the light or to ions with kinetic energies E. And uh, typically they are in the range of 5 kilo electron volts to 30 MeV and they are described by Rutherford's scattering cross-section. Also here, don't worry, it's not important to get all this formula in detail. I will try to show you the global picture. This is the probability for an ion of mass M or M M1 here, with the atomic number Z and the energy E. 
to be scattered at a target atom of the lattice, which has mass m2, atomic number z2, and which will be kicked off with the energy t. This cross-section is given here. That's the Rutherford scattering cross-section. With this, we describe the primary damage. The secondary damage, where a pKa, a primary knock-on atom, transfers it, its energy T along a displacement cascade to the neighboring atoms. Um, here, the energy T is best divided into two uh, parts. One is uh, the energy T which really causes damage, which uh, displaces other atoms, that's the displacement energy T dm, or the energy which only produces heat by light emission and so on, that's the electron excitation energy T electron. Now, it is quite easy to introduce a number, nu, which gives the number of produced Frankel pairs, because this is the most important damage which starts. So, nu, depending on the energy of a knock-on atom, um, is increased depending, of course, on the energy. If the energy of the knock-on atom is below the threshold, which is required to produce another damage, then, of course, number of Frankel pairs is zero. If it's between the damage electron threshold and the uh, twice as high energy level, then uh, nu is accounted for one Frankel pair. And <coughs> for larger energies, it's a simple linear extrapolation. That is, the higher the energy, the more Frankel pairs are generated. Then, the secondary damage, and again, here, forget the details, you can read them in a quiet moment, but that's quite simple arithmetic. The damage energy is calculated by um, factor, Kd, the details are given here, and a formula depending on uh, also the various kinds of the masses and uh, atomic numbers of the partners. And so, in the end, with, for example, a uh, threshold of 40 electron volt, results in a K of 0.8. This is uh, valid for most monoatomic targets and many alloys. So finally, the secondary displacement or displaced atoms or Frankel pairs are given by this result, which means if you know the damage energy of a primary knock-on atom, you divide it by 100 and then you already have the number of Frankel pairs. This leaves only one question, if we have T and damage, what happens with the rest? That's the produced heat, what we called energy for electron uh, excitation. And in iron, for example, depending on the primary knock-on atom energy, you see that in most cases, or not in most cases, in general, uh, we have to deal with energies for uh, damage which are lower than 100 keV. More than 100 keV are rather unlikely, while the produced heat uh, doesn't saturate, it simply goes up with or translates with rising energy. An example, how many atomic displacements do we see in an iron lattice as a result of a damage energy of 200 keV. As said, we have to divide the damage energy, that's the 200 keV, divide by 100 or multiply by 0.01. So, with a 200 kilo electron volt damage energy of an incidenting particle, pKa, 
this re uh, results in 2,000 displacements. This produces 2,000 Frankel pairs. You are with me? Yeah. Okay, then let's go to the next step. Total damage from this ion irradiation. Now we have to comp well to calculate primary and secondary damage. We have to combine both stages. That is the Rutherford's cross section, which was describing the primary damage and uh, also the number, the new, of uh, produced Frankel pairs. And uh, the whole displacement cross section, that's sigma d. How it's called? Uh, can you read it? Because it's light gray. Uh, okay, we have to perform an integration starting from the threshold energy over all over the whole pKa spectrum. That's up to the maximum energy, which was uh, in the range of 100 keV. Then uh, the Rutherford's cross-section multiplied with the number of produced Frankel pairs the integrated over the whole range of the pKa spectrum gives us now the displacement cross-section. And this cross-section describes the average number of displacements per lattice atom and per ion density. That's ions per square meter from the incidenting particles. So the total displacement damage results then from a multiplication by the ion current, that's phi, and uh, of course the period of irradiation, that's the time t, and the displacement cross-section. And if you have a look on the units, we have here displacements per atoms, then uh, per ion per square meter, that's the um, ion current, ions per square meter times second, and yeah, times in second, and everything cancelled out, and what remains are displacement per atoms. That's the DPA. So, this is the method in a broad view of how to account for, account for irradiation damage in terms of DPA by ion irradiation. The next step is ion irradiation is a very specific case. More interesting, uh, or it depends on the point of view, but at least in fusion systems or fusion reactors and also in uh, usual fission reactors, neutron irradiation, that's the problem. And the difference between neutrons and ions is that neutrons are free of charge and they are electrical neutral, of course, so they cannot transfer energy easily to electron shells or simply they don't. They don't easily interact with matter. So they can only interact with other neutrons and protons which uh, go back to the so-called strong nuclear interaction and by this interaction they transfer energy. Therefore, the penetration depth of neutron and matter is much higher, as I have already explained uh, for the comparison in steel, where we have one meter or so uh, in the given example, penetration depths. But also, neutron can only be scattered by nuclei, which means there is an elastic interaction, which is the sum of kinetic energies uh, is then constant, or inelastic interactions, which again produces emissions of light, or in that case, in, in this case most often x-rays, but there are also non-elastic interactions. And in these non-elastic interactions, nuclear transformation by particle emission take place, and this is what in the <coughs> end leads to radioactive isotopes. If you irradiate matter with ions, then uh, there is no activation, the result is a non-radioactive material, but if you irradiate matter with neutrons, then in almost all cases you end up with radioactive isotopes. That's a big difference. 
And another big difference or important difference to ion irradiation is that neutrons are not mono-energetic as the ions. Ions are produced by acceleration, so if you have an accelerator with, for example, 50 kV, all ions have the same energy. That's mono-energetic uh, um, ions. But neutrons, you cannot do this. Neutrons have, a, therefore, a broad energy spectrum. They are, appear in a variety of different energies. So this is the difference. It doesn't matter for the calculation much because the cross-sections of these neutrons is uh, calculated in the same way. We have also here the probability for a certain energy to generate a pKa. That's the same part as with the ion irradiations. Also the number of displacements generated by the primary knock-on atom. But then we additionally have to integrate over the whole energy spectrum of the neutrons. That's another cross-section given here. And um, Okay, in analogy to ion irradiation, this leads in the end to the same uh, scheme for calculation of the damage in DPA units. Now, if you forget all I have just told you and just focus on the result, this is already enough, we can distinguish between two basic elementary reactions. One is the <coughs> displacement damage by these cascades measured in DPA. And for the case of neutron irradiation, this is uh, what we call transmutation. Due to these nuclear inelastic reactions, there are new isotopes produced. As said, one case are long-living isotopes, or maybe also short-living, but in any case radioactive isotopes. But for the materials, much more dangerous are the light elements, like hydrogen or helium. They are also produced. And if you produce a gas inside a metallic lattice, this has to lead to some consequences, as we will see. So displacement damage, that's one part nuclear reactions, particularly helium transmutation, that's the other. As a conclusion, displacement damage we measure with DPA units. Um, incidenting particle collides with a lattice atom. This produces a primary knock-on atom, which causes secondary damage. And as a result, displacement cascades develop and the leftover of such cascades are various lattice defects, as we will see in the next chapter. Then the second kind of damage, that's transmutation. Under neutron irradiation, isotopes are produced. Two categories, one is gases like helium and hydrogen, the other ones are radioactive isotopes. This is uh, irradiation damage, and we will see the consequences. Just an example here, again, <coughs> molecular dynamics are a suitable um, instrument to simulate this. Here we have an incidenting particle of uh, 5 kilo electron volts which collides with an iron lattice. And this is how such a cascade develops. You see a big number of Frankel pairs, that's only the atoms which are displaced from their lattice sites. And over time, the number goes back again, it's reduced. This is an example of transmutation of tungsten. In a fusion reactor, I said the first wall will be made or has to be made of tungsten due to various reasons. So you start with naturally available tungsten, and that's a mix of these five tungsten isotopes. In this row, we have all the tungsten isotopes. The next row are chromium and so on, hafnium, lanthanium. 
And if we start with the reactor working, you see how a variety of different other elements are produced and how they develop in different amounts in the periodic system. So you start with pure tungsten and after five years mm, come on it's a bit tricky but well you can imagine after five years a lot of rhenium that's the green line and also a lot of osmium is produced, so you end up not with pure tungsten, but with a tungsten mix of uh, osmium, rhenium, tantalum, iridium, hafnium, plutonium, but also hydrogen and helium. That's the effect of transmutation. Now, the irradiation defects. What are the specific irradiation defects? We now have seen what two kinds of uh, damage can be done, but what is their appearance? First of all, let's go back to the observations. This is the only source I have found where something like a cascade has been really observed in situ in a microscope. And you see here this bright dot appearing under the microscope. And these visible defects form on a time scale of uh, yeah, tens of a second or so. So in comparison with simulation, simulation shows that the effect is due to clustering of vacancies. We will see what this means. In any anyway, the long time scale of cascade evolution is important. And let's again have a look on some simulations. This is a 30 keV. Here you have seen the atom flying inside the lattice. That's another type of uh, cascade developing. And over uh, some ten tens of picoseconds everything that remains looks like that. You see there are some defects, there are some vacancies and some other strange features left behind of this irradiation. Also here another example, cascade first it's blooming up producing a lot of Frankel pairs but in the end there is only a small number of defects surviving. And what you can see, the red points and, and, and the green groups of uh, points, these are clusters, defect clusters, which uh, is the leftover of a cascade. In the end, there are only a small number of defects, Frankel pairs or clusters of vacancies and interstitial atoms you can see. However, that's uh, causing enough trouble. So after the collapse of a cascade, there are relatively few defects surviving. That's important. Otherwise, um, materials would probably completely dissolve under irradiations. And the simulations show that we have to deal with vacancies, with interstitials, and with clusters of vacancies and interstitials. These are the main defects produced by irradiation <coughs> and by these cascades. Now we have to go more into detail. Let's first start with uh, self-interstitial atoms. Self-interstitial atoms, I think you know what it means. If a lattice atom is placed not on its lattice side, but some, somewhere in between, this is what we call a self-interstitial atoms. And such self-interstitial atoms are, for example, produced by the millions in an iron lattice. Um, in metals, and here we have an um, example for blue, that's tantalum, green niobium, red vanadium, 
this uh, orange is chromium, dark green molybdenum, tungsten that's uh, uh, whatever this color is, and black that's iron. On this line there are several configurations where such a self-interstitial atom can be placed. It can be placed along the 111 diagonal in, in, the, um, in the lattice or in a 110 side in the lattice. It can be placed on octetrahedral place or tetrahedral place or in the 100 plane. If you can view this in with one blink of an eye, maybe this is easier to catch. If we have a look on a FCC lattice, and this is the 111 direction of the atoms, and you squeeze here instead of one atom, two in this row, this is what we call a crowdion. That's in the 111 direction. So here, this is one of those, both atoms is a self-interstitial atom called crowdium. If you place it here, slightly shifted in the 110 direction, then it is called a dumbbell. So, in principle, you have the choice, but not only this, you, as I said, you could put them in a 100 plane or in octetahedral place or tetrahedral place. But never mind. Here are the energies, the direct uh, energy relative to uh, the crowdion, to the 111 direction. This we call V0. And now it is important that this configuration, which shows the lowest energy, has the highest stability. In other words, in the blue, green and red curve, the lowest possible energy of a self-interstitial defect is the 111 crowdion. This means in tantalum, niobium and vanadium, the crowdion is a the stable self-interstitial atom configuration. Now you see the black line and this shows a quite different behavior. Here not the crowdion, it's the Dumble, the 110 configuration is the most stable self-interstitial configuration for an atom. So in iron, not the 111, but the 110 dumble configuration is how self-interstitial uh, atoms are formed. Here, if we compare it with uh, chromium, molybdenum, and tungsten, you see in tungsten and molybdenum also the 111 crowdion is most stable. For iron again the 110. But for chromium there is almost no difference between <coughs> dumbbell and crowdion. So in a chromium lattice probably most, uh, there are both varieties um, almost equally distributed. But in iron we have to deal with a dumbbell. This is the difference in terms of motion inside the lattice because if you think that all these defects remain still for all times, you are wrong. They move, they can diffuse, they migrate through the lattice. And well, this is the case for the dumbbell and here in a few seconds the crowdion will reappear again. Here it is. And here is an example for a self-interstitial cluster. That's uh, more than three atoms clustering together in a on interstitial places. And um, okay, this is for iron, this is for tungsten, because in tungsten the crowdion is stable and self-interstitial clusters can be in tungsten or iron. This doesn't make any difference. What I want to show you here, that this defects and defect clusters are moving inside the lattice. Here is another example. Here, this is how the Graudion is moving. It's simply squeezed through this 111 channel, whereas the dumbbell sometimes appears, then it reappears, diffuses away, 
and then again you see it here, and so on. So there are several mechanism, mechanisms and uh, ways for migration of the self-interstitial atoms. So in general, the lattice is not a dead system, it's a living system. There is a lot of things going on, even at room temperature or slight medium temperatures, a lot of these defects are moving around or migrating. Of course, there are also defects which, who, who doesn't, but most of them do this. Okay, so far, interstitial atoms, vacancies and clusters of both kinds are uh, defects which occur after irradiation, but if you have a close look on this TEM uh, image, you see small circles here at the tip of these arrows. And they are also uh, rather tiny in the range of a few <coughs> to about 20 nanometers. And this is a very specific kind of another defect in metals after irradiation, that's dislocation loops. If you remember our picture from the morning of this complicated dislocation networks, then this is another species of dislocation. These are tiny loops which also form as a result of irradiation. And, okay, if we have a look on this image, you could also think that these dislocations stay there, more or less motionless. But, well, I don't know whether you can see it, but can you follow this point here? <coughs> it's like a fly <coughs> in the lattice. <coughs> If you see these points here, <coughs> you have to cut this out later. <coughs> so you see some of these dislocation loops obvious are <coughs> obviously are highly mobile and some are not. Again, this is another uh, image. You see, some of these dislocation loops are more or less stationary, but many, many others are not. They are flying around or moving, migrating, um, like bacteria under a usual microscope. Again, <coughs> another study, the slower motion. Here, the dislocation loops are larger, they have already increased, and if you focus on those or those, you see they merge together with time. They interact with one another and of formerly smaller single loops, they form a bigger, larger loop. And this process goes on and on. So growth of dislocation loops, uh, in this case in ultra-pure iron, irradiated at uh, room temperature. So uh, growth of these dislocation loops is also a phenomenon. Yet another observation. We have to look on the scale here. This is uh, 500 nanometers, this is 100 nanometers, and what we are observing here are missing atoms. So, in reality, these are voids, and this is the name of this defect. Single vacancy can cluster, they are attracting each other, and in the end, what is remaining is a big hole, or lots of more or less big holes in the lattice. Also, this has, <coughs> of course, dramatic consequences, as we will see later. So, as a summary, dislocation loops, self-interstitial atoms, self-interstitial clusters, voids, 
Frankel defects. These are all typical remainders of an irradiation cascade. This is uh, how we can consider dislocation loops. If we have solute atoms in a real alloy, then not only self-interstitial atoms, then also these solute atoms can be uh, end up in interstitial locations or they can form clusters. And also vacancies, as we have seen, can form uh, yeah, big um, holes in the matrix, but they can also mix up with uh, uh, dissolute atoms. So a variety of defects are produced. Some are mobile and some are not so mobile. This is uh, about what we will end up after irradiation. That's the defect summary. Now let's have a short view on the transmutation damage. So far this was all um, displacement damage, now the helium production. This can also be seen under transmission electron microscopy. What you see here, netly rolled up along dislocations in this case, are tiny helium bubbles. <coughs> As I said, during the transmutation, in, uh, during neutron irradiation, helium atoms are produced. Helium then diffuses through the lattice and finally they agglomerate the helium atoms and form tiny, or at least at the beginning, tiny helium bubbles. If you produce more and more, the, bubble, the uh, helium bubbles grow. Formation of helium bubbles, preferably at dislocations or also at grain boundaries because these uh, dislocations and grain boundaries are the natural sinks where these helium bubbles uh, like to grow and like to end up. This is the effect of transmutation damaged by helium production. You are still with me? Yes. So let's go to round three. That's the irradiation effects after a few seconds. Okay, so far New questions will obviously come up. What about the stability of these defects? Are there, as we have seen for the case of helium, trapping mechanisms? Is there a chance for the material to recover, maybe by higher temperature or well, whatever measure, measures? And can the defects, for example, Frankel pairs, can they easily recombine questions like that, or how do defects affect the material properties? In the end, if it comes to design, this is probably the most important questions. And, well, as we have seen, there are a variety of ingredients to consider this. We have the interstitial atoms, the vacancies, that's the point defects. Then we have interstitial and vacancy clusters, that's, uh, yeah, at least more than one or two of the Frankel pairs. Then we have dislocation loops. This was also a specific kind. We have voids and we have helium bubbles. And now, unfortunately, we have to go through all of these uh, different varieties. There is one type of measurement which you cannot easily recognize on this uh, slide here, but we will have, we will go through this in a minute. You can imagine that if you have a metal lattice with lots of defects, then it has a consequence on its electrical resistivity, or on the other hand, on its electrical, uh, um, uh, whatever, let it be resistivity. So, what we do, or what one can do in an experiment, you measure the resistivity, electrical resistivity, or conductivity, doesn't matter, and you increase step by step the temperature and see how it recovers. Recovery means with increasing temperature, there is a chance, and as we will see, it, it really happens, that the defects 
or at least some of the defects vanish. They go away simply by heating up the matter. And on the upper diagram there is the number of defects. Let's now first consider uh, single vacancies. We have vacancies, single, that's the point effect where atoms are missing. If you increase the temperature, you see here at one specific temperature the curve goes down. There are less vacancies available and at very high or higher temperature again the curve goes down until we have almost no vacancy left over. The yellow curve that's for single interstitials. The yellow curve here also it goes down but already around 180k or so no interstitial is available anymore. And that's why here in the second curve down here that's the derivative wherever you see a peak this means there is a significant change of number due to let's say vanishing or recovery as we call it in material science. Now let's start again. The first thing which produces a peak is the reduction of vacancies at or around 100 Kelvin. Then there is another peak. This is due to the reduction or vanishing disappearance of interstitials. And again we have here a peak at 100 uh, or nearly 200 K. That's due to pairs of interstitials. This curve. And then we have pairs and clusters of vacancies. That's this and this curve. They appear and reappear. This is producing these peaks. And so you see, depending on the defect, whether there are single uh, interstitials <coughs> or single vacancies or pairs of interstitials or pairs of vacancies or three kinds of interstitials or three kinds of vacancies or even bigger clusters, they all disappear at certain temperatures. And this is the recovery behavior of a certain material with temperature. Or in general you can say if we heat up this type of lattice uh, of uh, up to more than 400 Kelvin, the only defects which are surviving and still available are these orange ones. These are interstitial clusters and these darker blue ones, these are vacancy clusters. So small clusters or single point effects vanish quite early in several stages, but at higher temperature only the bigger clusters survive. This is again recovery. Vacancies, interstitials next, then interstitial uh, clusters with two and three interstitials or vacancy with two, three and four. And so finally what survives at a higher density are interstitial and vacancy clusters which more than four of their species. This is uh, maybe interesting and also important to know. Then again please focus on the mechanisms, on the phenomena, not on the details. This is just a detail. I have found a plot where the dose rate is varied here is the rate of DPA, of damage produced per time, per second in this case. And uh, what you see here in three lines is the number of vacancies which is obviously lost during time, depending on the dose rate. You produce defects at a higher and higher rate. This is along that line. And what you see is that in some cases vacancies are lost with a different uh, frequency and 
due to this observation, you can again draw a conclusion, namely that there are several mechanisms why vacancies vanish, why they go away. And this we have to consider now more in detail. That's the defect in direction. And let's first consider interstitial atoms. They are highly mobile, as we have seen or not seen. They may form clusters, this we have seen. They may also recombine with vacancies. That's clear, because if it jumps back in a vacancy, then we have again the perfect lattice at that point. But they may also vanish at dislocation cores. If you consider interstitial atoms, and if it moves here directly at the dislocation core, then the dislocation has been increased by one additional atom, and the interstitial atom has vanished. So the same thing can be thought about vacancies. They are a bit less mobile compared to interstitial atoms, but they also may form clusters and also nano voids or later on even big voids. They may also recombine with interstitials and they also may vanish at dislocation cores. If a vacancy moves here, then this atom is away and the dislocation has been reduced by an atom. So in any case, Dislocations are natural things for these interstitials and vacancies. And without mentioning it, but it's clear, other things are precipitates, grain boundaries, that's uh, the obvious thing and a natural kind of material structure. Now, how do voids perform? First, if you have let's say nano voids, that's very small uh, agglomerations of uh, vacancies, then they might not be stable enough to survive. They immediately could decay into single vacancies again. That's comparable to black holes. You all know black holes, of course, in the universe. Big black holes are stable. They last for, I don't know, billions of years, if not longer. But very tiny black holes, which nobody has seen yet, but theoretically they exist. <coughs> Ask Hawking, and he also produced a theory for it. Tiny black holes can vanish, they dissolve. The same is true with nanovoids. Dislocation loops, that's another story. They may be highly mobile. You have seen them uh, speeding through the lattice. They may grow by interaction, you have also seen this. They may increase their size, but they also can be incorporated into other dislocations, then they vanish in dislocation network. They can annihilate at grain boundaries, then they are gone forever, and they may be immobilized by obstacles, by uh, precipitates or solute atoms. This is what can happen to dislocation loops. Here is a scheme which describes it in one view, I hope, but nevertheless, let's go through it. We start with a cascade producing all these large numbers of defects, namely interstitials and vacancies. Then what happens to these vacancies and interstitials? Due to interaction with the dislocations and grain boundaries, but also due to solid solute atoms in the lattice and uh, due to simple recombination, they go away. It's a recombination process due to several reasons. Then vacancy and interstitials are cancelling each other out. So they are gone. Then Interstitials can form uh, loops, dislocation loops. This dislocation loops again can annihilate by the reaction with other dislocations or at grain boundaries. The same is vacancy. Vacancy can also form clusters and uh, well 
these clusters can uh, interact uh, in another way. We come back to that later. Um, and finally, the clusters, if they are big enough, they end up, they don't vanish in the crystal. And what do they cause? It's hardening. Remember the story from tomorrow. If you have something, uh, some defects in the matrix, then this leads to hardening because this location cannot move as easily anymore. This is how these interstitial loops, these location loops, how they end up also. If they are large or big enough, they are stable, they don't go away. And what they do, they block other dislocations from movement, from gliding. So they are also cause for hardening of the material. Then all the rest of interstitial and vacancy, vacancies which haven't recombined, they build a survival fraction of it. They both diffuse through the lattice and through this enhanced diffusion going on in the lattice, they change the microstructural evolution. And if the microstructural evolution is changed, this also results in hardening. So, in one word, the final effect of all these remainders of cascade produce or effect hardening of the material. You can also put it in simple equations and theories and I don't want to go through all these things but if you just read a few things uh, you see that there is an effect of a matrix feature. These are loops and all these defects. There is a CRP term which means coverage precipitates. That's nothing else as a, a defects. There are um, alloying contents, effect of dose rate, effect of product form, plate or rod or whatever. So to summarize all these theories up and conclude, irradiation damage is of course a rather complex field. That's why I want you to focus on the basic mechanisms. Many dependencies in this model which go far beyond the scope of this uh, lecture. But you, it, it's enough if you focus on the main mechanisms which are hardening, which I have just shown. And then we have to have a look on the effect of voids and helium bubbles. So again, what I have shown you up to now is that many of these ingredients of these results of irradiation lead to hardening. What we haven't seen now is voids and helium bubbles and this will be described on the final chapter where I show you the <coughs> real mechanisms of damage and how it looks like in the material after irradiation. So our questions are what is the effect of irradiation hardening? <coughs> this you might or should already know because it's nothing else as uh, like any other hardening mechanism we have already looked on this morning. A uh, more interesting question is uh, the formation of voids. What does this cause? And of course helium transmutation, how does this affect the material properties? Here again are two MD simulations where uh, this location glides along its glide part, uh, paths or glide planes and at lower temperature here with one Kelvin it ends up at an obstacle. This obstacle is a <coughs> dislocation loop and at higher temperature you can see that the dislocation can easier go through this uh, dislocation loop which means at low temperature, all this irradiation hardening is more pronounced. At higher temperature, also due to the fact that most of these um, defects are recombining and going away, but 
also at higher temperature dislocation can move more easily and that's why at higher temperature the irradiation hardening effect should be less pronounced. This can be simulated and drawn as a conclusion from this simulation. But let's see how it works in the real world. This is a study of tensile properties and this dotted pink curve that's the 9% chromium steel in the unirradiated condition. And now we have to start from higher temperature, in this case 450 C irradiation temperature. And you see at such high tem uh, irradiation temperature there is almost no hardening effect at all on this material. But if you go down to 400 centigrade, then you see already the material shows a hardening effect since the yield strength as well as the ultimate tensile strength increases. If you go further down with temperature, then the effect is much more pronounced. There is a tremendous amount of hardening. Also, the yield strength goes up. Ultimate tensile strength is in that case almost not recognizable anymore. And uh, finally, if you go, go down to uh, 250 and 300C, you see the highest amount of hardening. So, what we have called hardening damage in the material reflects or mirrors simply in tensile tests by increasement of the yield strength but also loss of ductility because there is no strain hardening anymore and uh, the specimen fracture after a smaller elongation. That's uh, the summary. Test temperature and yield strength in the non-irradiated material yield strength decreases with growing temperature and the other way around, if we irradiate, in this case 9% chromium steels, at 450 centigrade, there is almost no hardening effect, but if the temperature goes down, then hardening goes up in a rather impressive way. Uh, starting from 400 MPa, we end up at more than 800 MPa after irradiation of uh, 60, 16 dPa. That's the dose rate, uh, that's the dose dependency. If we irradiate again 9% chromium steel and measure only the irradiation hardening over the doses, you see at the beginning of the irradiation of maybe up to 20 dPa, there is a very steep increase of hardening and well from 20 dPa on to higher level the increase is not as high anymore. Temperature was constant here in the range around 300 centigrade. That's the effect of irradiation hardening on tensile properties. If you know that, that's all you need to know because there is not much more to know except very tiny details. What we have done with tensile properties, I show you now for Charpy test or fracture mechanics. In principle, the same happens in the, uh, on the Charpy properties. We expect or we observe an increase of the ductile to brittle transition temperature because the material embrittles due to the hardening, but also toughness goes down a little bit due to the irradiation defects. The same can be seen in fracture mechanic studies. DBDT is shifted to higher temperatures because the material embrittle. On the left hand side, these are a variety of chromium steels and you see the difference of their DBDT and Charby characteristics that's just due to the alloying, due to the composition. All these materials have been irradiated and what you see here, we focus only on two uh, different types of steels, unirradiated here 
and after irradiation a rather big shift of the ductile to brittle transition temperature. This means this steel is not a very good material for structural applications under neutron irradiation. Compared to this steel, the same irradiation campaign, the same irradiation parameters, and the shift is comparably tiny. So alloying certainly has an effect on all of this. But again, also irradiation temperature. Here DBDT is shown and again we follow it from higher to lower temperature. These are the unirradiated properties. At 450 degrees C irradiation there is almost no embrittlement, no hardening effect, but as with tensile properties, if we go down with the irradiation temperature, more and more of these interstitial vacancies and, and dislocation loops are surviving, are remaining, and this makes the material hard and brittle. And that's why DBDT is shifted enormously if we go down with temperature. Also the same as with tensile properties, if the dose is increased, the embrittlement or shift in DBDT increases very fast and quickly during the first 20 dPa and after that the increase is a flat or even saturates or at least it seems so. Time for conclusion. The expected effects compared to usual hardening mechanisms are the same because you can only harden a material uh, by what you have. In this case I have given you a few more ingredients uh, by irradiation but the effects are the same. Dislocations cannot so easily glide anymore compared to a perfect lattice and this is what makes the material harder and stronger. Irradiation hardening decreases with temperature and in practical terms this means for example for nine chromium steels if you irradiate them at 400 centigrades or even higher then the irradiation hardening doesn't take place or at least at a very low level so this would be a very good operating regime for such materials if you want to use them in nuclear applications. Now, again, the next property. We have tensile, we have fracture mechanics. Now, how does it affect low cycle fatigue properties? And I will restrict myself to the complexity of the topic to this slide. Because, um, well, let's go one back. What is your guess? How does it affect low cycle fatigue, the irradiation hardening? Does it increase the lifetime or does it decrease the lifetime? The answer is here, right there. We, let's first restrict ourselves to the lower temperature where the material embrittles most and where, where it shows the most hardening. And funny enough, the lifetime is increased and it is increased enormously. We have a really pronounced increase of the lifetime after low temperature irradiation. And again, that's, a, that's the beneficial or positive effect of hardening. This is what we have said for uh, cycle, uh, cyclic loading. There are many defects and these increase the lifetime. If we go to higher temperature, then hardening vanishes and there is almost no uh, difference between irradiated and unirradiated. Of course, this is uh, only true for, again, 9% chromium steel here. So in conclusion, irradiation hardening can increase the lifetime in low cycle fatigue tests. At least this is true for materials which show uh, LCF softening as uh, seen this morning. 
Now, how does the irradiation affect creep? This morning we have seen creep appears around 0.3 to 0.4 of the melting temperature. Here is a very simple study. A bolt has been fixed in a plate with a stress of 250 MPa and then this bolt has been exposed to neutron irradiation and as you see after a dose of 10 dPa the bolt has completely released the stress which means the bolt has been plastically deformed and this was due to creep and interesting enough the temperature was rather low, much lower than where we have uh, observed creep in the unirradiated condition this morning. If, this morning I told you in steels around 500 C or so we see creep or again 9 chromium steels. Here already creep starts at 2 to 300 centigrades. And well, if you remember well, creep was closely connected to diffusion mechanism and what I have told you a few minutes before is that due to the surviving interstitial and vacancies we have an increased amount of diffusion going on in the lattice and so it's not surprising that creep under irradiation is a much much uh, more problematic issue which already appears at lower temperatures. Here very quickly again the explanation if uh, this dislocation is tensile stressed, then uh, the diffusion of such a self interstitial atom tends to go there, which uh, in the end uh, increases this uh, dislocation. This is called um, Uh, ah, well, uh, CPA, I will uh, <laughs> show you this on the next uh, slide. Another effect is that, uh, as said in the morning, dislocations can easily climb only if there is dislocation. This is uh, due to diffusion of vacancies, for example. If a vacancy comes here, this ends in a dislocation climb. And here you see stress-induced preferential preferential absorption. <coughs> this means that dislocations which are oriented in this way due to the load grow more easily than this dislocation. That's the CPA effect. And uh, also there is a special distribution or unequal distribution of loop size and of loop densities, that's the SEPN or networking um, mechanism, a uh, nucleation mechanism. So under irradiation, in short, climb mechanism goes easier and also the uh, orientation of this location is uh, preferential in the one or other case. This was creep. Now again, next jump. What happens with the vacancies? Up to now, all we considered these hardening mechanisms. The remaining questions have been what do vacancies to the material? And before I go to this slide, I think you can answer this question for yourself. Imagine you have a dense lattice without any defects. And then, then you put tiny voids or bubbles, holes inside the material. But you don't remove atoms. Well, you might remove them and put them on the surface. But in any case, in the end, density of material decreases and the volume increases. That's the logic consequence of it. So if you observe a huge amount of voids in the material, it should be grown compared to the unirradiated 
state. And this is exactly what happens. This here is a austenitic stainless steel before irradiation, the same piece after irradiation. And well, it goes without saying, this thing has increased its size. And this is called swelling because swelling correctly describes what you see here. The material really and virtually swells under irradiation if it forms stable and many voids inside. So this in one word is the effect of voids during and after irradiation. Now let's have a look on the swelling behavior. First in terms of irradiation temperature and you see here also for the case of uh, austenitic stainless steel there is a maximum uh, effect on a certain temperature range in this case between 450 and 500 C there is the swelling peak where the material forms obviously most and biggest stable voids. If the material was cold worked and cold working material or stainless steel means you increase the dislocation densities, you intrude a lot of dislocation networks, then swelling is not as pronounced. And if you remember right, dislocations are sinks where voids try to move. And so if you have a lot of dislocations there, then many voids also try to locate themselves along the dislocation. But interstitials do the same. So all these many dislocation lines are the natural recombination centers for dislocations and interstitials. And so if you have a higher dislocation densities, then the amounts of surviving voids is smaller and then the swelling is less pronounced. The same is true for copper. In copper the peak swelling occurs around 300 to 350 C. So in principle for all metals swelling behavior is the same, which is wrong because I forgot to tell you, and this we see in a minute, that this also depends on the lattice structure. Up to now this is only true for um, face centered cubic lattice structure and this is how swelling goes with those, the involvement with those and well forget about the microstructure. At the first uh, few or up to 10 dPa nothing happens in this uh, 316 austenitic steel then uh, some tiny nanovoids are uh, forming which we call incubation then there is a transient evolvement and uh, finally you could consider the growth of the voice as a linear dose effect and this has been compared with different alloys of the 316 steels. This is the classical steel which swells in the range of uh, well more than 6 or 8 percent at around 70 dPa but Another type of uh, austenitic steel has been produced with more and more tiny and fine titanic, uh, titanium carbides, fine precipitates. And again, remember, precipitates are also sinks for this voids and interstitial recombination. You can uh, consider them as recombination centers. And so if you produce a material with many fine distributed uh, precipitates, this affects swelling in a positive way since this reduces the swelling behavior. But here in green is the swelling behavior of ferritic martensitic steels or in general ferritic steels. And you see there is a flat line and this tells us that, that in BCC structured metals or, or at least in uh, ferritic martensitic steels this is not true for all PCC structures, but for martensitic ferritic steels. The swelling behavior is not at all a problem, since up to really high DPA, very high doses, there is a very low swelling rate. It's uh, below 1%. So this is the big difference. Here again, 
recombination centers. These can be precipitates. In this, in this picture, we have a steel consisting of iron, chromium, and nickel. And already after 0.4 dPa, you see a lot of big voids. And here with 109 dPa, that's a several uh, um, orders of magnitude higher doses, you can see it from your point, but there are millions of very, very tiny voids. And this is only due to very fine precipitates of phosphorus, silicon, titanium and carbide. So this is a valid measure to reduce swelling. Concluded, swelling depends on vacancy production and uh, vacancy dynamics. It depends also on the lattice structure. You can influence by the sink density, the number of precipitates or uh, dislocations. And it also strongly depends on temperature, since there is only one peak in temperature uh, with regard <coughs> to swelling. Swelling resistant materials are based on solid solution. Alloying chemical composition is an important measure to avoid swelling or reduce smelling. And BCC lattice structure, in, for example, in ferritic steels are, at least uh, in steels, better compared to the austenitic steels. And fine precipitates or dispersions helps also. Now we are almost through. The only remaining question is what happens with helium and the helium bubbles and helium transformation. How does helium affect the material properties? And here was a very distinct study where a 9% chromium steel has been tested by Charpy test. Then we have produced only this displacement damage, this hardening, which shifted the DBDT by around 20 degrees C. And then we have included by irradiation only helium in the same specimen and see just by adding helium and by the formation of helium bubbles, you increase further DPDT. So at the first view, the effect of helium means material embrittles in addition to all the other hardening mechanism. Then the same study has been done with two similar type of steels where one steel produces almost no helium under irradiation and the other steel produces uh, 400 atom part, atomic parts per million helium. That's a lot, by the way. Same conditions you see with uh, irradiation uh, temperature with uh, decreasing temperature, the embrittlement, the shift of DBDT proceeds here from minus 100 to plus 50 C. But with additional helium uh, content, the shift is much more pronounced. We start at minus 100 and end up at plus 207 T degree C. So in the first case, without helium, we have an embrittlement by 150 degrees C. With helium, we have more than twice this amount. The same has been done with a different type of also materials where extra DBDT by helium formation was measured. And uh, with rising helium content, the shift of DBDT increases. That's clear. This is how such a rather brittle fracture of a tensile specimen looks like after it has uh, more than 400 APPM of helium. It looks like the microstructure looks like here. You can see millions of tiny helium bubbles. And uh, if the helium bubbles uh, arrange themselves at the grain boundaries, you see here easy crack formation around these grain boundaries. And this causes, in the end, brittle fracture 
which is only due to helium formation. There are also models, of course, we don't have to go into detail here, but one of these studies is very interesting. They predict or say that the helium effect is more or less negligible up to about, well, they say 650 APPM helium in steel, in 9 chromium steel, in terms of practical measure, let's say a few 100 APPM helium is what a steel can uh, sustain and then there is a sudden drop of all the mechanical properties in terms of embrittlement. And this is also what causes problems in uh, fusion applications because a lot of all these uh, internal parts are made of 9 chromium steel and well the lifetime of such a very expensive power plant strongly depends on this accumulation of helium and since you cannot avoid helium transmutation there seems to be a natural limit where you can use these steels up to and this seems to be given at or around of a few hundred APPM helium. If we have reached that limit then uh, we better shut off future fusion reactors. Conclusion with respect to helium bubbles. Finally, the helium bubble formation of course depends on the transmutation rate and dynamics, also on the sink density. If the bubbles are distributed fine uh, along many dislocations or precipitates, then it's less dangerous. This is also where ODS steels came into play. Temperature make also a difference. At lower temperature, helium bubble formation is not such a problem as uh, it is at higher temperatures. And in, with respect to materials development, we want to have many and fine distributed precipitates or dispersions. This will avoid the bubble formation at grain boundaries, which cause this uh, dangerous brittle fractures. And in general, you have to avoid elements that directly transmute into helium. And typical examples are boron, also nickel, and unfortunately only two or three iron, uh, iron uh, elements, iron isotopes. So in general, light elements produce helium and, well, in steels and most other materials you cannot avoid to use the one or other light elements. That's why we in general have to, li to live with the helium bubble formation. If you are still with me, you can go now because we are through. Thank you. Welcome.